Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, actually, I'm also, I was just walking around the office uh, and uh, speaking to someone and said that we had this topic and um, this guy is also going to die and he was also intrigued. So <laughs> it's very, very interesting. Oh. Yeah, great, and, uh, great actually, I'm also... Uh, Oh, uh, one second. I'm trying to stream live to YouTube. Um, this guy is also going to dial me. Also, oh, sorry. One second. So, uh, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. ah, okay, it's a, it's a delay. Yeah, it's a delay. So I need to switch that off after I'm learning how this uh, this stuff works. Allow bidding. Here we go. Yeah, it's. Not for kids, save. So I think I think we're also live on YouTube. I'm still struggling with, uh, with that system, but um, maybe oh, I can see uh, people raising hands. So Tristan, maybe I, I can already make you the host, which mm -hmm. uh, puts you in full control. Okay, great. And it also means that I'm not in control. Huh? Just so you know that, uh, <laughs> that, that I can no longer do anything from that point onwards. Yeah. I guess people come in automatically, right? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Already 14 people in. and uh, that I'll, I'll do a quick... Uh, yeah, here we go. Great. Good to see you. Hi. Great to see you. Hi. Fantastic. Where, where are you coming from? Uh, which uh, in Germany, I guess, right? Yeah, it's um, Würzburg in Bavaria. Okay, great. Quite so, nice. Uh, Usually, a lovely place, but turned out I think we had the strongest regulations when it came to the pandemic. But okay. well, no, no spring is coming. It's uh, is it lifting a bit? Because here in Amsterdam, I can see it's it's changing quickly now. We we have quite some cases still, mm -hmm. but then. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, the restrictions are are being lifted quite uh, rapidly. Yeah. Um, Germans are late adapters. So it took us a while to actually do restrictions and regulations. Mm -hmm. And also, well, now also takes us the time to get out of this restriction mode. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's still, it's, it's still, you still have to wear masks and, uh, and, and, and all those things? Or? Yeah, you have to, it's almost, it's 3D, 3G almost everywhere. Yeah. Um, and I think we are now the, the last, we're still discussing VAX mandates. While I think even Austria yesterday or day before yesterday stopped that. Okay. Okay. So, okay. I don't know. <laughs> Let's wait. <laughs> I've waited for two years for, for freedom to come back. I can still wait a couple of, of <laughs> more weeks. A couple it's, more days. It's quite fine. Right. I'm, I'm accustomed. I'm an introvert, so I'm quite happy staying at home with my fiance. <laughs> no, then, then you're lucky. I, I'm, 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 yeah. I'm still not sure if I'm an introvert or an extrovert, but uh, I'm a psychologist. So I, I would even question the, the dimension there a bit. But yeah. Uh, but I definitely had a really rough time in the last two years. Uh, sitting yeah. Indoors. It was, uh, for me, for me, it was okay. What I also did this big five test. Turned out that um, my my openness is a thing that made me struggle a little because there are not so many new impressions like outside, but lots of new impressions like here. So that's that's yeah. quite fine. But well, I have to see. But I, I realized that. So I know from my past when I spend a day completely alone, then I get a little bit antsy and mm -hmm. want to meet people. Like yeah. really. Um, but oh, since we're living together um, here in this apartment, my fiance is also more leaning towards introversion. It's quite fine. So we yeah. had our relationship blooming during pandemic. Oh wow! Um, so it was fortunately not the other way around, but well. I think I think you're the first person that actually uh, tells me that the relationship <laughs> improved during the pandemic. Really? Yeah, I, I heard a lot of people that that had a bit of a rough time, which I can understand if you if you're if you're stuck two years and and, and it's harder to go out. So yeah. it's uh, yeah. Nice, nice if that's a positive note, right? Okay, great, great to hear. It's, well, <laughs> great. Maybe I'm a little inspiration. I feel a little like elderly couple where well, one cooks the other and, and together we eat and then we, we, we swap and sometimes we have our after lunch nap and these things. <laughs> she learned baking. I, I learned a couple of more dishes for cooking and well, 
yeah, but, yeah. but in in total it well going out is definitely a thing that that i need so i have plans for meeting people i mean this, this is quite fine doing it here as a, as a webinar and meeting people on zoom that's not a real thing yeah yeah i have my fingers crossed yeah so, and and so already uh i guess yes 26 people already waiting for us so it, it's uh, it, it's coming along really really nice to see and uh yeah, I, I, super super curious. I have a one year old, and um, um, and and the one thing that that she so she, she's twenty five percent Kenyan and and seventy five percent Dutch. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we did when she was very young is we had all these these sort of Kenyan African dancing songs, and we would sort oh, of great. take her for a spin in the evening. And I, the the one thing that she responds to instantly uh, is if you switch on music, doesn't matter if it's in daycare or at at home. You switch on music, uh, especially if it has an African rhythm a bit. You see, like the hands go up and it yeah, that's starts, good. Starts, starts moving. <laughs> so it's a very sort of primitive initial response. The happiness is is very sudden, right? It's it's instantly there. So yeah, really beautiful uh, to, to yeah. see how, how how innate that seems to be uh, for her. It, it is. It is similar in the family. So I'm my, my family has a strong background in rock music, mm -hmm. <laughs> and now my my niece is. Five years old will will get will turn um, six this year in summer, and she is already, well, to a good degree into Metallica. <laughs> yeah. Wow! Uh, so, so there there is a lineage of uh, yeah, there's a reaction. Yeah. 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 Wow! <laughs> Have you heard about this Wacken Open Air? You know that one? No. Nope. It's one of the biggest European metal festivals that uh, always every year. Well, except for pandemic in northern Germany. And my grandfather actually opened that once, like as an opening act. And but but the beautiful thing is, he's part. He also, um, well, my late grandfather has been gone for a couple of decades now. He was part of a marching band playing the clarinet. And the deal yeah. is that when they open that festival, it's the marching band that plays first. And they had some relation with that. And then he traveled there with my grandmother, and I actually opened there. Yeah, it was quite nice. Yeah, fantastic. So it's uh, I, I had a, a grandfather who was also really into music. So from from my mother's side, um, and I think he he didn't know how to read the uh, the, the chords on 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 my I say, but but he was he was able to play everything because he could hear it uh, on piano and in different instruments. Yeah. Uh, every yeah. birthday that I remember, where he was present, that always at some point he would take some instrument and everybody would start singing and and, and do stuff. Yeah, right, right. Which was it was amazing. I, I don't have that uh, that same uh, skill level, so I, but it's. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it's it's a, it creates a very different atmosphere. Yeah. If, uh, someone that's, like that, yeah. that's that's an open secret that I'm way better in composing than in performing. Yeah, well, performing well, that's, is a <laughs> that's at least uh, a good half of it, right? It's important. Yeah, right, right. I can play a little the guitar and a little on on a piano and keyboard, just a little, nothing, nothing really significant, but. When it comes to composing, this where I really overflow with joy because then yeah. you you have nothing and you create something like programming. You have nothing and you create something. Create something, yeah, I can imagine that is. Uh, yeah. And and part of that composing is that now AI or is it maybe I'm too early with the question, but uh, or is that still still a, a, a human? Yes. Uh, well, most of that I, I'll talk about it later, but it's. I think almost 98% of the notes in everything that I publish come from AI. Yeah. yeah okay. Okay. So that, that's, uh, that's yeah. quite significant. Yeah. <laughs> makes my life easy. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll stop asking questions because I, I think uh, yeah. I want to give the room to others. So, so we have, uh, I can see there's 54 people waiting for us to, to go. Perfect. So that's, that's, uh, that's really great. Um, yeah. give it one more minute and then mm -hmm. uh, I'll do a very quick, uh, kickoff. Mm -hmm. And then I'll hand over to you and I'll also switch off the camera because I, I think the focus should be uh, on you and, and otherwise okay. they, they, yeah, they, I'm uh, just an annoying uh, figure in, also on in the screen, which is not that relevant. Ah, don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, okay. uh, not where I should be focused. Quickly. Um, do you see the slides? Yeah, I see the slides. Perfect. Do you see the browser now? I see a black uh, composer. Uh, uh, yeah, the browser, yeah. Yeah, kind of darkish, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So that's all I need for today. It should work. So fingers crossed that the thing won't break down. But we'll see. Uh, we have time. Um, we have, it's uh, 45 plus 15, right? 
it's it's uh, let, let's say it, it's it's as long as it more more or less 45 minutes into those questions then uh, yes yeah yeah let's so, let's aim at that let's aim at it so it's three o'clock let's uh let's start so everybody welcome um i think for uh, another another amazing uh, amazing webinar sorry to um i have to get into it we already had a good conversation here earlier we've already been chatting for the last 15 minutes so uh welcome uh, tristan for you as well um super happy to have you very very interesting topic uh, maybe a couple of notes before we go in for all the listeners. So we have a lot of signups. Uh, it's over 750 people, which means that if you have uh, a question, then you may find that your question is, well, um, it's, it's a bit hard to answer. So please put it on the chat. Uh, I'll make a note uh, and I'll make sure that uh, Tristan sees the question at the right point in time. Tristan, for you. Uh, I'll make sure that that you get it not during the talk, but at the, the moments when when it's appropriate. So I'll try to moderate that as uh, as well as I can. Um, I, I think we have people from India, from the Netherlands, from Germany, probably from Japan. So it's global. Uh, with that, Tristan, over to you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the for the kind introduction. I'm, I'm so happy to be here today, and lovely to see. I have this tiny little counter that even more people are coming, and so welcome. And also happy to hear that we are now in multiple time zones because, well, it's now a global community that, that mankind is creating. Okay, topic for today, music generation from Mozart to Transformers. Um, well, I hope that you have at least heard a little about Mozart and Transformers. If you immediately think about robots when you hear Transformers, I have something to show you later. Well. Just quickly about myself, I'm not going to talk that much about biography. So I am Tristan, um, got a PhD in artificial intelligence. I did this, um, yeah, a decade ago. Yeah, really, this year is, is 10 years. Um, I work as a hands-on advisor for artificial intelligence. Well, deep learning is the, the things that I do most of the time. And I'm also an AI composer, and I've published a lot of AI music on the internet. And that said, please, if you like, reach out on LinkedIn. Um, you can just connect immediately and find me on YouTube. I have a lot of things uploaded there. And also, I mean, for Instagram, it's not the perfect tool for music, but for pictures. Okay, there you go. Before I talk about the current state of the art, so what is currently going on in generative music, especially with deep neural networks, I'll give you just a brief history of music generation. So when you think about it, um, mankind or man as a species, humans as a species, um, we are very musical. So there's music always around us. So we are, we are constantly surrounding us, ourselves with tunes and rhythms. There are people who also claim that we are a species that started singing before talking, which is, I think maybe, maybe makes sense. And we have a long history of musical endeavors, like, um, when you remember those bone flutes that we found in caves and also the, the, the drums that, that we used millennia ago. So it's a long history, but it exploded a lot. And part of the explosion, I mean, just when you think about it, um, 1600 to 1750 Baroque, where people claim, well, this was an area um, or an era in Western European music where the, can I say, the complexity and the harmonic complexity of music was at a peak. There was something already called figured bass. And this is generative music because, well, you don't see it in the notation, but I'll explain to you. Usually in figured bass, what you would get is what you have here at the bottom. So a bass line, this is notes that a bass instrument would play. And then you get those numbers here. And those numbers would tell you which notes to put on top of that. And you could usually improvise a tiny little melody on top of that. So it tells you that this is fixed, but this you can improvise while playing. And this gives you a huge variety of music that can be generated just from this tiny little seed. Well, has been a couple of centuries ago. It's the first example of generative music, to the best of my knowledge, but it's not really mechanical yet. So we're not using tools for that. Speaking of which, a great tool for musical composition is the dice. Musikalisches Würfelspiel, musical dice game. Um, people say that it comes from Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. There are people who claim, well, not really. I tend to believe that it is. And this idea is almost straightforward, where you have um, you play a game. And the game is that you throw a dice. Well, it's two dice at the end of the day. And you sum up the numbers. And then you know where you are. And you start with one, two, three, four. 
And if you throw an eight, you would have this one. And if you throw um, a seven, then that one and so on and so forth. And the beauty is that those numbers correspond to tables of measures. So tiny little pieces of music. And as you can see here, well, the overall goal is that you go from left to right by throwing dice. And then you look up tables of measures, well, pieces, measures from the table of measures, and then you combine them and you play them. And well, I think all of you can do the math in your head. If you have um, so many numbers, 10 numbers here, and you have um, eight in that direction, how many combinations you have, especially if you do it twice. Um, it's a lot, and to the best of my knowledge, it's very it's, it's impossible to play all combinations because it will just take aeons to do this. Great example where you have two dice and you throw them, and that allows you to generate music. And one thing that I would love to ask you to keep in mind for the rest of the talk is that here there's a table of measures. So someone sat down and created those measures and you look them up. So you have a table where you can go for musical material that you combine. So a little later, um, fast forward to the previous century, Iliac suit for string quartet, 1956. Um, great time. Um, my father was born back then. And there are two people, Lejaun Hiller and Leonard Isaac, um, Isaacson, and they created, at least people believe, the first composition using composer only. And this first composition called computer music, um, the Ilex suit is a string quartet. So you have four strings, four string instruments and everything composed by the computer using Markov processes. So basically random processes that would predict the next note. Um, it's in vinyl, an LP. I actually own it. I found it on the internet and bought it immediately. It's something that you can listen to, but the trouble is, well, it is sometimes a little bit too erratic. And if you grew up in um, um, the, the, if you grew up listening to a lot of high quality musical material, then you get the feeling that something is uncanny about that music. But still, it's a milestone and definitely something great that happened in history of computer music. Next, stochastic music by Yanis Zenakis, 1971. Um, Yanis was um, an artist on multiple modes, so also doing music and architecture and quite a lot of other things. And he also took things, inspiration from mathematics and especially processes from mathematics in order to help his composing. So classic music roughly translates to random music where you have some degree of randomness in it that would give you a little inspiration and you can continue with that. So that is quite, quite fine, 1971. Next thing, um, this is where it gets really, really interesting, a connectionist approach to algorithmic composition. Um, connectionist roughly translates to very close to deep neural networks or to neural networks in general. So it was, to the best of my knowledge, the first time that someone published a paper about using a neural network for form composing. What you see here is just a rough sketch for a couple of input nodes and hidden units and output units. And you see a context at the bottom, the memory, the memory of a melody so far, and you have a couple of other things, and then you have an output here. And this is just a great example, a very early example of a very strong principle that in generative art we use all the time. It's called autoregression, which means that you have, um, you have a piece of music and you ask an AI, an algorithm, a model to predict just the next note. And when you can do this, given a couple of nodes, predict the next one, you can do it again and again and again and again until you have enough musical material to continue with. So this, please keep in mind, strong principle, autoregression, just predicting the next node. It's, it's very easy, but as I can show you later, it really, really grows in complexity. A little later, Harmonet is a little bit more. Um, harmonizing chorales in the style of Johann Sebastian Bach. Johann Sebastian Bach, um, Baroque period, this implementation and this paper in 1991, um, two years after David Hasselhoff tore down the Berlin Wall, almost single-handedly. I was um, not a teenager yet, still growing up, and this happened. And the beauty about, he, uh, about this is it uses the chorales of Johann Sebastian Bach. Chorales uh, or a chorale is a piece of music 
that has been composed um, for singers in church. Usually it's four voices and the people that sing those chorales are not really professionals. So they are regular churchgoers that also do the singing. It's usually four voices for soprano, the alto, the tenor and the bass, and they sing together. And what Harman did is harmonization, which means you have a melody. What are the corresponding three missing voices there? And well, it seems that it worked like a charm, but still um, 1991, it, it didn't, it made an impact, but it's nothing in comparison to what we can do today. But what I can already say is those chorales by Johann Sebastian Bach today are our hello world um, or our MNIST. When you do image processing with deep neural networks, the first thing you would do is predicting here is a picture of a handwritten digit, which digit is it? When you do music modeling and music generation, that's where you would start. So you take all the chorales by Johann Sebastian Bach, uh, you would download them and then do deep learning on them. And this is when you've done this, you already learned a lot. And everything that remains then is just scaling, getting more data, training uh, bigger neural networks. So 1991, great time to be alive. That's when, <laughs> when Europe had this first wave, I think, of Eurodance or techno music. 2002, fast forward, I think I was in my first year of computer science studies. Um, very important work using the LSTM. LSTM is a dual neural network architecture that is very, very established, especially when it comes to sequence processing um, by Schmidt Huber and the other co-authors. And LSTMs, what they have is some, some sort of memory where they process sequences and they can keep track of the elements in the sequence and then do a classification or even a prediction. This is a neural network that has been trained on blues music. And then again, quote unquote, just predicted the next node. So here a little bit more, let's level up. Just a few years later, 2016, Bach bot, again, Johann Sebastian Bach. And here, this is a chorale. So it's four voices, different color codes. They are all sounding at the same time. Looks very beautiful. And well, if you cannot read sheet music and those piano roll notations, at least you would get the impression that this is very, very structured. There are patterns in there and patterns that repeat. And the main contribution of Bachbot is, um, well, before I say that Bachbot, I think was a master's thesis of a student. And the main contribution is training on four part harmonies of Johann Sebastian Bach using the LSTM architecture and then see what happens. And second part is also doing a strong evaluation with people. So you have a new network generate something and then you have people listen to it and evaluate how good the quality is. And this is, well, the second part of the Hello World. If you would like to solve or get started with music generation, you would take the Johann Sebastian Bach chorales and then use an implementation similar to Bachbot. Let's continue getting there. Music Transformer 2018. In deep learning, we had at least two great moments. Well, there were many, many great moments, but the two greatest moments were in 2012, when we had the ImageNet moment, when we realized that we can use deep neural networks with convolutional layers in order to solve um, image processing problems at scale. Solving the ImageNet competition was quite an impact. And since then, the landscape has changed entirely when it comes to computer vision. So the people who say there was computer vision before and after 2012, um, before that, you were implementing a lot of algorithms and now you train neural networks to solve your problems for you. On the other hand side, another great moment in deep learning history was attention is all you need. Attention is all you need. A paper released in 2017 that introduced the transformer architecture for natural language processing. And if you do the math, 2017, 2018, well, already in 2018, there's a music transformer um, that, well, does music composition, you realize immediately is a strong hint that natural language processing and music processing are very close to each other, as we are going to see later. Well, so far, um, music transformer after just one year after the, the big impact with attention is all you need. And finally, this is a paper that I really, really love. So you're all invited to look it up on the Internet. 
MMM bei um, Jeff Enns und Pas Pascal Pas uh, Philippe Pasquet uh, 2020. So if you look at the calendar, that's where things got a little weird. Um, and this is a, a paper that I really, really love for two reasons. Well, it is now music generation also at scale with way bigger data sets than well, just uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. And the main contribution of that paper is not the deep neural network architecture. It is the encoding, how to encode musical data into something that a deep neural network can understand. And then it has, well, and this truth, it has one paragraph about how to train a neural network on that. And they say, well, you just use this API and then these parameters for that architecture. And then there you go, this one paragraph. And this, I found it very, very inspiring because usually you have a big portion of every paper about the neural network architecture. And they said, well, just do this and then everything else by the book. Fascinating. So this is where we currently are. And now after this little round trip when it comes to history, I will tell you a biblical story. And this biblical story is a story that happened in 2021. And it's biblical because it took 50 days from Easter 2021 to Pentecost 2021. So the period from uh, the Passion of Christ to, um, well, giving everyone the Holy Ghost. Um, well, it was quite a nice time for me. So spring was already starting and well, I'm a freelancer. So it's either me working a lot or having some time for myself. And this was an opportunity for me because I was just leaving. I just left a project and I had some time on my hands to get more projects. And well, while I was waiting to get more projects, I started that. And it was a great opportunity for me to come back to my big to-do list and grab an idea off the shelf and implement it. And this idea was to actually train a neural network on heavy metal music. So it was a, quite a, a strong idea that I always had in mind. And it took seven steps. And the first step was implementing the paper I've just talked about for JSB, Johann Sebastian Bach Chorales with Hugging Face. So I started um, just this, this Hello World it means that I want to get going and I want to understand what's going on. And the best way to understand what's going on is implementing the paper. And one thing that make it easier for me is that I use the Johann Sebastian Bach Chorales, so 370, I think, which is way easier than 150,000 songs, because then I get immediate results and see that it works. Hugging Face, on the other hand side, is just a great tool, a great platform, a great company and community if you want to train neural networks in NLP. So it's just you take a model off the shelf and here's the data and then you train it and there you go with just a few lines of code. Um, I will say a little bit more about that later. So that was the first step. Once I had this up and running, I had the confidence that I'm actually onto something. Next step, getting a big enough heavy metal data set. Um, well, as data scientists, fairly easy. You find the sources on the internet and then you scrape them. So fortunately, I found um, 7,000 heavy metal songs. Um, yeah, I found 7,000 heavy metal songs on the internet, which is a good, decent size for doing some deep neural network training. Then I trained a couple of neural networks. So it was a, like, a, like almost a chain of experiments that I did. And also implementing a composer tool. Well, having a deep neural network that can do some music is one thing, but you also have to go through the man-machine interaction. You have to come up with something where you have a way to communicate with the AI in both directions with a couple of buttons that makes your life very, very easy. And then, well, compose and produce two songs, uh, 12 songs, sorry, doing cover art, find a band name, find song names, and then release. And I can tell you in those biblical 50 days, I spent, I would say, at most two weeks doing the deep learning part, and everything else was me composing with the neural network that I had, which tells you that doing music generation is now more um, like a, um, a low hanging fruit. So it's not that difficult anymore because things progressed a lot. I mean, now it's the easiest thing to do, um, training JSB with hugging face, and then you get an immediate understanding. But still, challenge is you have to make a scale, you have to find enough data to train, and also you have to integrate coming up with a great tool that allows the users to compose some music. The experiments that I did one to three. The first one, roughly 400 Bach chorals, I think it's a little less. And then I, I quote unquote, just took 1,400 rock 
and heavy metal songs that I already had somewhere on my hard drive. And I trained a new network on that and I saw, ooh, that is quite a surprise. Um, because Bach chorales, they are quite, well, say tame, because always harmonically sound and always all voices sound together or there's silence. It's, it's, it's not, so it's usually very, very dense when it comes to the amount of notes. With rock music, um, you have the occasional break and you have different chords in there and different arrangement of instruments. So I thought it was a little bit more complex, but it turned out the same neural network could just handle that and it worked almost immediately. And then with um, that neural network trained, I got the confidence to go even higher. And then I trained on 7,000 heavy metal songs, as I've just mentioned. Here, well, not a, not a thorough overview, but it gives you an impression what kind of data I was dealing with. It's a word cloud and it tells you how many samples I had for each subgenre of heavy metal that I could get my hands on. The bigger the font, the more samples I had. So it tells you that most of the stuff was just plain heavy metal, but you can also see there's a little death metal in it. Um, power metal is the one that I ended up using most because it's very, very, it's almost classical music. So I like the harmonies that came out of that. I created one or two songs with black metal, which is usually a little bit different when it comes to emotions that are being conveyed. So it's a little bit strong, a little bit grim, a little bit darker. Also fresh metal, a little faster. So there's heavy metal and it goes in, in so many, so many different directions. And well, this is an overview of the data set that I trained on. And I also made sure that I have a conditional generation, which means that I could ask the AI, please, dear AI, give me something in the um, style of industrial metal. And then it generated a couple of notes and there it went. And I took those notes and it turned them into music that I then published. Listen, can I ask a couple of questions in between? Yes. Uh, there's a couple of questions that uh, pop up uh, every time. So it, it, it's uh, just for your information. I, mm -hmm. I think uh, we already have uh, 50 questions and a Discord channel set up live. So there's already okay. a lot of stuff going on uh, while you speak. Great. But a, a couple of uh, mm -hmm. simple notes. Uh, can we share your YouTube channel later with, yes, with the crowd? Yeah. So that's, that's a yes. Uh, could you share some of the papers that you mentioned? Do, do you have them yeah. available? Yeah, I, I have a big overview, like a big list that I can also make available. Great, great. And and the yeah. slides? The slides, let me think. Yes, yeah, so I can make them available as well, yeah. Great, great. That's, uh, yeah. uh, and, and then the, the question that keeps popping up here on the is on the data input. So is that MIDI or is that, uh, I, I'm not familiar with all the possible mm -hmm. uh, ways of, of how, how the sound input could be, but what's the format? that you use as input. Yeah. Um, in general, there are two things that you can do. It's either audio or it's symbolic music. And symbolic music includes MIDI. I did the, the MIDI road um, for the straightforward reason that doing it on audio is too expensive. It takes way too, too long to train. So when I generate uh, music, it just takes a couple of seconds. If you would do the same exercise with audio deep learning, then it would take hours to generate just a tiny little piece of music. So I, I did the symbolic music. Well, and I guess um, let's let's do it as follows. I will make it a little bit shorter now, mm -hmm. and then we have a lot of time to answer questions. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, well, I think I, I think follow follow your own logic because the questions also follow the the conversation. So it's okay. It's uh, but just know that it's uh, because I, I know as a speaker it, it's hard to see what's going on, but there's a lot of stuff going on on the side. Just, yeah, just yeah. So you know. <laughs> Sorry, I cannot I cannot monitor <laughs> that. Okay. No, I know. Okay, let's okay. let's keep all those questions in mind and we ask them, ask and answer them later. So yeah. coming back, language generation and language generation easily translates to music generation with auto regression. It's something that you have to keep in mind. It's this principle of just predicting the next token and the next word or the next note. It's a great example. Harry Potter, a student at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, is a great. And as you all know, different things that could happen. It's a great wizard, a great hero, a great boy. And as you know, there are a couple of things that you would not take into account as a next word. So we're talking about probability distributions of words that can appear next in the underlying line structure that comes from the data set. Music, exactly the same thing. If you have a couple of uh, notes, which one is the next note? That's not really, it is something that follows a structure that you have to take into account. And this is something that neural networks can learn. Speaking of which, um, the transformer architecture, just quickly from the paper 2017, attention is all you need. Um, deep neural networks with self-attention, multi-head attention. 
And the beauty about those neural networks is you can stack them, stack them. You can go them, go with them really, really high. And those uh, numbers of blocks go into the dozens. And the right side is most interesting. Um, it's the um, decoder transformer, which is also GPT and GPT-2 and GPT-3. The language generation models that maybe you've heard of, they are all here on the right side. And it's the same neural network that I used for composing. Coming back, like how this works, the Bach corrals. This is a Bach corral. You've seen this before. It's a little bit more simplified. And this is the music um, in MIDI format that you can just listen to when you have a MIDI player. You see the four voices in different color codes. It looks quite nice. And also you see there's a certain harmony. There's some structure in it. There's a couple of rules. I think a number is 300 rules that you have to follow in order to generate such music. And here's the back, big reveal. Following the MMM paper, this is how you encode this. And what you see immediately is that, well, if you take some effort, you could read this. It's a text. It's natural language. And that's the whole trick. So you have to come up with an algorithm. Um, so not a very difficult one, but it takes some effort to map from those music events to those texts. So P start is the beginning. Track start means there's one voice starting. Inst means the instrument. Here's the bass. So what you see here, those tokens, those words, they represent this entire red melody. The entire red melody. If you look closely, here's a note on event, which is here on note 61. And then time delta, it's four, um, four sixteenth note that go. So it's, it's um, a, a fourth going here. And then the note stops. You start a new note and so on and so forth. It's a very robust encoding. Well, it's a little bit strong to read because it's now all linear. It's not in parallel anymore, but a neural network doesn't care. It can just process those. And tiny little hint here as track start, tenor, then the next voice would come and then the next voice and the next voice. So it's all in a sequence according to the MMM paper. And what I really like about that is how powerful this is. If you train a neural network on those samples, which you can generate with a lot of effort, then you would have a neural network that would predict the next of those tokens according to the structure that you have. One thing that you can do is just start with piece start and it would generate a couple of tracks. But what you can also do is you start with all that and then you provide a couple of notes and then let the AI continue, give you the next instrument. Also, you could imagine that the AI gives you a melody and you change it slightly. And then you give it back to the AI and come up with more accompaniment. So that's, that's extremely powerful, but you have to wrap it into a tool. Next, heavy metal. This is where I thought it would be way more complicated, but positive surprise was, no, it is not. I had the feeling, well, there's going to be living hell for me because now I have drums, which is percussion, not harmonic. And I also have um, voices that, um, that, that sound in, in polyphony, so multiple notes at the same time. So what you see here in orange, though, this is the drum, the drum kit playing something. And here in red, this is um, the rhythm guitar playing power chords. And then in blue, you have the bass. So this is how heavy metal would look like. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated because at the end of the day, you have way more instruments sounding at the same time. Put heavy metal turned out same encoding, nothing need to be changed, it just worked out of the box, I got way more data, I had to train a little longer, and there you go. Hugging phase, very important if you want to do language generation, including music generation, this is where you would start, because then you don't have to implement all those neural networks. It's very, very straightforward, very, very elegant, and also very accessible. So again, it took me two days to learn Hugging Face and have everything up and running on a stable level. And I've since then used the same code with a couple of extensions. I'm still using it today. And it's just, so I'm going to show you now just a few lines of code. Um, a little technical because, well, it's also good to have a little technical stuff also. Um, you need a couple of things. The first thing is a tokenizer and the tokenizer takes the texts the text that you have seen here and maps them into individual notes, individual events, and then those gets mapped, get mapped to just numbers because deep neural networks, they work on numbers only. So this is the translation from the string to numbers. 
and it's just a simple white space split in the world um, level, it's, it's fairly easy to do that, just a few lines of code, and then you have something that you could feed into the neural network. Next, I mean, this is the amazing part, and this resonates a lot with why I like the paper a lot, because this is what the paper said. The paper said, use Hugging Face, use GPT-2, the language um, neural network, use eight hats, which is um, how wide those neural networks is, how many channels of, of data movement they have, and also how many of those blocks you have stacked on top of each other, and the sequence length, how many tokens you can process. This just came from the, um, yeah, just came from the paper. Worked like a charm, fantastic. And if you run this, you have already the, the model up and running. And finally, to train it, that's what you do. You plug in the model, a couple of training arguments, the data set for training, the data set for evaluation, and then train out a train. Hopefully, you would do it on um, a computer that has a GPU, because this takes some time. Um, and and uh, you will go. And finally, once it's trained, the only thing that you have to do is call generate, where you give it a couple of IDs. Those are the tokens mapped as numbers, can be just P start as a number, or a couple of nodes as their numbers. And then it would generate 1,000 in total with a temperature. And this you then have to map back to MIDI. And temperature. It's a very, very powerful thing where you can change the degree of randomness. If you go up with the temperature, you have more randomness, so the music gets more chaotic. If you go down with the temperature, it gets more deterministic. It doesn't take any risks. So sometimes it's just repeating itself, bum, 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 because it's the easiest thing to do. So something you also have to play with. Good, that's the training. This is a custom composer tool. Um, I will show you the current installation in, in a moment where you actually have an AI running on your computer, works locally, no problem. And um, it allows you to compose with the AI by clicking a couple of buttons in, in the sense of a dialogue. So you have AI doing something, following your request. Maybe you say, give me death metal. It produces something, maybe it's just the drums or just um, a riff on the guitar. You get something back and you say, well, this was okay. Or maybe mm, have something else. If this was okay, then you would say, well, give me another piece of music, give me another track, and then you continue. And what I also have here is a go wild button where I just click the button and go to fetch a coffee. And once I come back with a coffee, it had generated quite a lot of music. And then the musical material, I store it to disk, and then I open it in Logic Pro and continue from there, like rearranging the pieces into chorus and verse and so on and so forth, adding synthesizer instruments there, Today, I'm also adding guitars to it and then rendering it, maybe adding lyrics, publishing it on the internet. And what I have to tell you is that it saves me a lot of time. So for me, the whole production part goes down from, from let's say, eight hours per song down to four hours per song and still the same quality, if not even better when I'm using the AI. Good. Here, standing on the shoulders of giants, I cannot mention it enough, MMM, definitely a paper to look at. And the code also available. Um, this one, AI Guru, that's me, publicly available on GitHub. Um, it shows you how to solve Johann Sebastian Bach chorales with Hugging Face. I um, think you can do it on just Google Collaboratory and then, well, having a lot of fun with that. So it's, it's free for you, my gift to you. And finally, there's the invitation before I show you a little demo of mine. Um, feel free to check out my music project Hexagon Machine. It's available everywhere. Um, you can just see it on Spotify, also on YouTube. I have now released three albums of cyberpunk metal. So metal that has been composed with AI. Um, and I'm quite busy working now on the fourth album, but this time I will take my time. That said, let me show you the demo. So fingers crossed that it still works. Just the tool that I am currently using that I have developed. Um, I've already prepared. So this is a piece of music and I hope you can hear it. So now I have to ask, Renz, could you hear it? No, I, I didn't hear it. Okay, let's try that again. It's the easiest thing to do. Yeah, sometimes if all those demos with computer audio sometimes need something. So maybe this. Yes, that okay, was. Okay, there you go. Yeah. There you go. So this is something that AI has 
composed this morning. And if I push this, but this button, it will give me guitars. Takes a moment. There you go. Guitars added on top of the drums. Let's listen to that one. Yeah, well, maybe I don't like that, so I do that one again. You have to keep in mind, this is a deep neural network that still runs on my local computer on the on the MacBook Pro and it's still very fast. It doesn't run on any special hardware, so there's no GPU required. Okay, interesting. Let's give it another shot. Okay, let's, let's listen to that one. Okay, and just to, to finish this exercise, let's add the bass. Here comes the bass. Maybe you can, can hear it, it's very low in frequency. Well, and, and I have to tell you, this is something that keeps me busy almost constantly. Um, this is just just the one tool that I use for my own music, just using the new network that I've trained last year. And I've been busy this year training more and more new networks. So I have pop music. I have different styles of classical music um, also up and running. I have a new version of a heavy metal thing. And so I'm, I'm going to spend quite some time on, on implementing more tools doing that. So it's, it's, it's quite, it's, uh, I, I have quite a lot of fun with that, but it also takes a lot of time. But it's fantastic because in my so I've been composing for a couple of decades now, but now I'm never challenged with oh I don't have any ideas because the ideas come from the AI. So I'm immediately in let's create something really really nice, and it usually has more ideas than I can handle. It means that while I was developing everything and just testing it, it already generated musical material that I wanted to immediately turn into songs, but I had to really constrain restrain myself. So well. That's a brief overview of uh, music generation and currently while well, using the transformer on MIDI files is something that is a low hanging fruit. And then, well, thank you very much. And now let's let's have your questions. Fantastic. There's a lot of compliments on the on the music and, and I think people like it a lot. So thank you very uh, much. And, and, and very impressive. And, and uh, thanks so much. So, so the list of questions and, and, uh, and everybody's still listening. Uh, uh, feel free to add more questions on the chat when we are having this conversation because I, I think more will pop up but the first question is uh, from Kent and, and I think it's a fair question it's, it's the same question I had in my mind uh, yeah. listening to you uh, and that is if this ideation this this creative part also comes from AI now how do you look at the future role of musicians when this is relatively easy to do yeah um, it's still it has a lot of burden and the burden is that you still have to curate the material that comes out. First, you have to come up with the right prompts, like steering the generation in certain directions. And then you have to also find the musical material that currently fits the mood that inspires you the most. Um, but one thing that's definitely there is that when you think about human creativity on all levels, and this definitely includes music and writing, also programming, that you are always oscillating between coming up with something from scratch and then editing it, fixing it, making it better. And now it's only the fixing it, getting it better part, yeah. which, well, you learn something about that, but also to a certain degree, something is missing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, fair enough. And and the question that's now popping up uh, as we speak is, is, have you tried with vocals and uh and, and singing so obviously that that also comes with language but but i i'm sure you you've tried so what is the yeah what's the story there um um when it comes to my own creativity i'm now at a crossroads so i have consciously only published music that is instrumental because i i did experiments i had ai generating texts and i was singing to that um which gave me quite quite good results, but still it did not feel as a whole, like in, in a sense that is one thing that is that is really computerish. 
Um, and what was missing then is I need a singing AI that and an eye that I can can provide a melody and also a text and it would sing. Currently available, I would love to use it, but it's in Mandarin. So someone already solved that. I'm waiting for someone else to retrain that neural network on, let's say, English and yeah. maybe different varieties of vocals. So I'm still waiting for that. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's, it's super interesting. Uh, hey, and uh, a couple of questions that relate to starting in this space, right? Yeah. In, in the audience today, we had a lot of people uh, who are either musicians or uh, practicing data scientists and ML engineers or both. Um, so a lot of questions, where do I start? Is there a great course on this? Is there a university? Is there a first data set that everybody should get? What, what mm -hmm. is your advice? It's different, different answers. So yes, definitely, definitely training an LSTM on Johann Sebastian Bach music. That would be the first thing to do, like the big goal. And then um, getting some more inspiration and learning more. Um, Google has a project called Magenta, you know, the color. And it's a, a great, a, like a, a, a playground, um, has a lot of code, lots of Jupyter notebooks, and even um, I think it's Ableton Live plugins that you can use. And it's all about um, creative deep learning. Well, first and foremost, it's almost entirely music and you get a lot of inspiration from what they're doing. So usually you would do Johann Sebastian Bach and you'd also get more inspiration, learning more about what is possible from Magenta. And then of course, um, yeah, you already mentioned that, the, the list um, of, of resources, I think we're going to provide them, uh, provide them later. It's also quite, quite a lot of things to have a look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sahil is asking how much computation power is usually needed. I know you, you just ran that uh, locally, right? So yeah. but, but maybe uh, so, so do you still need a, a local GPU or is that? Mm. Um, I'm waiting for this to get faster. So under the hood is PyTorch. Um, mm -hmm. I use the PyTorch variant of the Hugging Face GPT-2 model. Um, I trained it on a GPU and it took, so this model we just heard, it took me four days to train on four GPUs somewhere in the cloud. Okay. Um, running locally, quite fine, Apple M1 already very fast, but PyTorch is not yet hardware accelerated. So I have high hopes that maybe next couple of days, maybe a few months down the road, I get an update of PyTorch. And then it's going to to work um, even faster on my local computer. So it's still quite tame. No need to get some GPU for that, at least for the inference. Yeah, yeah. Then then uh, a couple of copyright questions. Also for me, as a, for, a, from the strategic point of view, right? So if, if your input data is music from uh, producer X and Y, and, and you create something that is, um, let's say, a combination of, of X, Y, and Z and, and, and some uh, some other creativity. Is, how, how does it work? Is that is that your music or is, should you reference them? Or what's the what's the system there? It it depends on where you are. I'm, I'm not very strong on those, those law thingies. Um, but I, what I can tell you is when you talk about the copyright in the American sense, um, anything that comes out of an AI is not subject to copyright because how the copyright law is formulated only applies to humans. So America, America, a completely different thing. In Germany, we have the Urheberrecht, which is um, by, by no stretch of the imagination precise. So we have people that just copy paste from someone else and they get through with it. And there's still a 20 year ongoing lawsuit between a rapper and electronic music um, band Kraftwerk about a sample that is one or two seconds long. <laughs> but well, also, in order to uh, also defending AI, it's still to a, a huge degree um, inspired plagiarism. That's also how we work. We as humans, we usually take inspiration from something and then copy it and change it slightly until it's something else. And this is not 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 um, not trying to play this down. It's, it's really how most of the music is created, and this applies one hundred percent to AI. Only difference is you can just do it with a click of a button, and you get a lot of material in a small amount of time. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the the way that AI does this is, is similar to how human beings actually yeah. are creative. Yes. Uh, but 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 the laws so far seem to be different for an AI system than for a human being generally. Yeah, it depends on where you are. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, and and in our chat before uh, we went live officially, right? We mm -hmm. actually asked you how how many of the nodes are AI and how many of the nodes are human, and and then. 
um, I think you mentioned it, it's like 98% of the nodes are AI. And so I, I was curious, is that is that normal also in the industry now or is that, um, or is that still mostly human? Like, like how do you see this industry develop? Um, I, I think most is, is human still. Um, there are some tools available that you can help that can help you with that. Um, when you think about chord sequences, I mean there are MIDI packs and and plugins that you can buy that give you a chord sequence, and then you change the chord sequence into melodies and and turn these into songs. It's definitely a, a thing that you can do. But the thing with that approach is that it's very very fine when it comes to granularity because it gives you notes. Um, on, a, on, a, on a level that you, that you can change. It's, 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 it's very amazing, like what kind of details the AI spits out. And well, yeah, it's true. It's almost it's almost 100% of the notes that come from AI. So usually I add two or three events to the drums in order to do a transition from one part to the other, but not mm -hmm. composing at length any melodies. I get everything out of the AI. On the first album, Hexagon Machine Robot Uprising 2021, there's one song composed by me without AI. Yeah, yeah and, so well, that, that's fully, fully human. <laughs> yeah, fully human yeah. and people struggle yeah. to find it. Yeah. Including oh, okay. myself. Okay, great. <laughs> great. Uh, there, there's more questions popping up. Uh, it's a super yeah. fascinating topic. Um, I have a question here from Akash. Um, mm -hmm. So he says, hey Tristan, here's Akash from India. Master students, uh, have you done any work using ABC notations as data set? Uh, and can you please mention the limitations working with the ABC notations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, namaste. Um, greetings to India. ABC notation is, is a very, very great thing. Yeah, definitely there are data sets available. Um, and those natural language processing models that I use, they work with that. And I can share a secret, something that I found out just recently. Um, OpenAI has this great new network called GPT-3 which is available. Um, you can now sign up and get access to it. Um, it's a little code in, in, Pytor, no, in, in Python, and you can use this to generate texts. And it has been trained on the entire internet. And the entire internet also contains samples in the A. So you can prompt it to generate something in ABC notation, and then you just put it in a tool and generate something. I did this just a few weeks ago, and I was amazed to see that this new network already can do music, and it's not trained on them. So just per coincident, coincidence, it learned about music. Yeah, hey, here there's a there's a more personal question and uh, uh, and it's 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 asked by anonymous, so I, I don't know mm -hmm. the name, <laughs> but uh, I've asked for the name. So hey Tristan, uh, I'm pursuing my uh, masters in data science in Bangalore, India. I've been very inspired by your work, and I want to do my PhD in this field, and would love to work with you if you're available. So. Um, <laughs> if you're open to it, I can make the link uh, after the after the presentation. Yeah, people, I mean, definitely people can re reach out, but well, my, my trouble is that I do not have so much time to, to work with people on an individual basis. It's more like I do something and share it with the public, but no problem to say hello and maybe I'll tell you a couple of, of papers that you should have a look at. But currently I'm swamped with, with projects that I'm doing right now and there's no, no capacity. I can completely understand. But yeah, uh, cool. if, if, the, if the real name comes true, I'll at least make, make the connection and then, uh, but indeed we have to be respectful of your time and uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, another question, what do you think about implementing a graph neural network for music generation? Graph neural network for music generation? Mm, yeah, but well, the, the trouble is, I mean, and the good thing about music is all the interconnectivity between the different nodes, that you have a piece of music that corresponds to a piece of music that you heard earlier. Um, what the transformer does because of the self-attention, it already learns to find those connections. So actually they learn in graph structures and, and, and as, as matrices. So it's something that comes while you're training. Um, on the other hand side, graph neural networks, it would require you to get those connections between those events in advance. And maybe it would be a little bit too burdensome because at the end of the day, it was done that you have to create the data set yourself if your, neural, if your um, algorithms are not enough. But with attention, you just throw in the musical material and it finds everything for you. So it's hen egg problem. I think it would work if you find the right data set, create the right data set. Maybe it would have a lot of advantages, but so far I haven't haven't seen that much about graph neural networks and music. Okay, okay, clear. 
Uh, last two questions. Um, is there a way to vary the velocity of the notes? And, and this, this one popped up as soon yeah. as you showed the, 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 the first sequences, then, then uh, yeah. the question came up. Already a lot of discussion on the, on the chat, but yeah. happy to uh, hear your thoughts. Um, I, so the thing is with those new networks, the sequence length that you predict on is your limit. If you make it bigger, then you need more computing power. So it's um, a square law. So it, um, it, it grows with the power of two, both in memory and also in inference time. Um, so I had to make a compromise on how many nodes I can predict on. So I removed um, the velocity. But still, if you got a bigger new network, you can just, just put in the velocity as well. So we start a node and then you save a velocity and continue from there. Also definitely possible, but we'll make the sequences longer. Me, on the other hand, I just take everything that I get and I change the velocity in, in logic and, and I'm fine. Okay, okay. Uh, Akash is asking if you can mention the ABC notation work, I think the paper, uh, if you know that by heart. <laughs> no, it's, it's not a paper. <laughs> it's, it's actually that, that, I mean, ABC notation has a certain like a, a header, something where you come, you provide some information and then you have the musical material. And what I did is I provided a piece of a header and let the AI continue writing that. So I found a sample on the internet and here's part of it continue and it composed very nice music. Okay, okay, okay. Right. So no paper, just trying out things. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, clear, clear. And then, so I, I promise you the last two questions, but of course uh, in that period, there's more questions oh, popping up. You could have more. Uh, what are your views on AI music 10 years from now? 10 years from now, um, I hope we've crossed the threshold that everyone can do this because now it's only, only a few plugins that are available, not so many. There are a lot of, well, a little more Jupyter notebooks available, which are not, not friendly when it comes to, well, musicians using them. So you still have to know your way around Jupyter notebooks. I think this will be a thing of the past. Also, longer sequences and uh, more data. So I'm waiting for someone to solve the problem, um, getting all the music out of Spotify and mapping those to MIDI notation with a higher accuracy. So transcription of music, then I would have more data sets to train on. And I think this is also something down the road. Yeah. Okay, great. And and, and Spotify and Apple Music and, and these aggregators, uh, how do they view uh, AI music? Is, is that, can, can you just launch in their, in their uh, let's say, stores <laughs> or, or is that harder? Well, um, well, it's just at the end of the day, you have a couple of MP3s or no WAV files and you upload them. Um, it's, you need some, some publishing platform in order to, to do these things and um, if you could do this automatically this would be very very interesting but they are not it, it's not it, it takes a little time to upload data to spotify and i'm also think that they try to prevent people just uploading anything yeah. but but also as i said spotify um they are working on these things at least i believe that they are working on these things like you have your taste in music. What about ge generating some music that is according to your taste? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not yet, not yet. So that they would become uh, a, a music creation company at some point? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, it would be an interesting pivot uh, for yeah. them, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a question from uh, Agniva, which is a, a bit deeper. Mm -hmm. um, oh, let me find it it's moving too fast sorry um yeah sorry it's, it's from it's from dlip mm -hmm. um so in in this ai mastering sound space are there other areas uh where where you think this technology might apply and then he's given an example of audio forensics but so is this can this be used outside of music generation yeah definitely so what i have here is a generating model just creating more material but also um yeah, music information retrieval is a strong thing that you would do. Think about it as classifiers. You have a piece of music or you have a piece of sound. Same, music is sound, right? And then you do a prediction on that. Um, a, a couple of minutes ago, I showed this big transformer ar architecture and said only the right side is interesting for, for music generation. The left side is for music information retrieval to turn things into classifiers. So definitely a thing. And I have worked on audio projects in the past doing some classification on, on sounds that are recorded with a microphone. Definitely a thing. And a lot of my customers also worked on that. So it's a growing market. Yeah, yeah. And, and musical therapy, do you have any examples of uh, companies or uh, psychologists using this uh, yeah. for therapeutic yeah. purposes? 
Yeah, I got, I think, over the last four weeks, two or three requests from recruiters of companies that hire people for doing exactly that. Yeah, yeah. so, so that, that's also an, an upcoming yeah. industry. Then. That's yeah. <laughs> okay. Coming. So, uh, super interesting. I said I have uh, no time. <laughs> There was, there's a question from uh, Paranjoy here. Uh, GPT-2 was trained on Reddit data. Mm -hmm. So if you use that as a base, what do you think will be the effect uh, on the music if uh, you change the language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, I did not use the pre-trained GPT-2. I used the initialized, so untrained GPT-2. I just used the architecture and then trained it on music. What I'm still waiting for, and it's, it's, I'm a little bit sad about that. So GPT-2 is Reddit, um, GPT-3 is a lot of more things. And this a lot of more things also include source code. So GPT-3 can do programming, and they extended this with fine tuning, now you have the co-pilot. And I already mentioned that GPT-3 also can do the ABC notation, but it's not very strong on that. And the trouble is, and just to, to finish this, this, this answer, the trouble is that we don't have that much music notation on the internet. So I'm still waiting for a new network where you can interact with a new network in natural language, and it would create sounds or music out of that. So I'm still waiting for that. Yeah, yeah, clear, clear. I, I think we covered uh, that there's still stuff ongoing, but, but I think we covered uh, most of it. So, so Tristan, anything that we should have asked that we didn't? Well, as a, uh, well, I, I didn't say it. That, that that clearly but now it's the time to do these things things are just so easy they have never been so easy i mean if you think about the tiny little history that i showed at the beginning people had to invest a lot of effort and now it's 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 fairly straightforward a couple of things that i mentioned turn out to be just weekend projects if you already know your way around lstms and it has a highly creative potential and that's what i like and well fi finals final words about this is well, you can use AI for so many different things. And there are not so nice things like controlling attention of people, not the attention in the transformer, but well, you know, those great companies who just want to make sure that they click a lot. Yeah. And well, this, there are quite a lot of documentaries, but also the other side of AI where you use it for creativity, enhancing people's potential for writers, for programmers, for painters, for musicians, and the list is, is never ending. And we are now getting just getting new tools and better tools to even increase our creativity. And that's why it's so amazing to be alive. Yeah, great. I think that's the, the, the perfect final advice. Uh, Tristan, thanks so much. It was really wonderful having you. Yeah, thank you uh, very much. There's, there's lots of thank you notes and compliments on, on the chat. So uh, those, those belong to you. Uh, thank you very really, much. really, really useful and uh, super valuable session. Thank you. It was great being here. So <laughs> greetings to everyone there out in the world. And um, thanks for being here. Great. Okay, Tristan. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.